Reed and Shay with us. Um, so um, really without uh, further ado, we want to um, turn our attention to our guest speaker series. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to have Tori with us today. And uh, before we turn the screen over to Tori, um, I wanted to provide a proper introduction and um, appreciate everyone taking uh, the next hour or so out of your busy schedules to learn about her work and more importantly, to learn how to join in together uh, in, in the work itself. Um, as we do this uh, and we transition, we'll be um, ending our webinar today about 2.25 um, and uh, uh, from Eastern time. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I look for us to have some open uh, conversation at the end and we'll open up the lines. Um, but it's really important that we, we hear Tori's presentation first. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Tori Weiston Serdan is a scholar and practitioner with over 11 years of teaching and youth programming experience. She received her PhD in education from Claremont Graduate University at the age of 30 and has dedicated her life and career to teaching and mentoring young people in her community. She does extensive work with community-based organizations in support of youth advocacy efforts, specializing in training mentors to work with diverse youth populations Black, Latinx, LGBTQQ, first-generation college students, and low-income youth. Tori founded the Youth Mentoring Action Network, a nonprofit organization that focuses on mentoring. The organization has served over 500 youth, helping them to get to universities like Cal Berkeley, American University, Howard University, Clark Atlantic University, and Cal State East Bay. Tori's an expert in youth mentoring and she specializes in training mentors to work with diverse populations as a scholar she examines how marginalized and minoritized youth are served by mentoring and youth development programs she's passionate about young people and armed with a firm understanding of educational institutions she's a strong education and community leader who is using her voice to advocate for the youth voice um, on a Less formal note, I would like to um, share how I met Tori and was so intrigued by her work and how it intersects with the disability community. Um, back in January, I had the opportunity to attend um, the National Mentoring Summit hosted by our coalition member Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership here in Washington, DC. And at that session, um, Mentor's rep, Elizabeth Santiago, who's on the webinar with us today, uh, introduced me in a meeting to Tori and some of Tori's colleagues um, like uh, Steve Vassar. And um, the discussion was home. It was a movement that was certainly time, but it took me back 25 years ago when I learned in um, my undergraduate studies um, about um, civil rights and about um, creating a more just world order. And when Tori discusses social change theory and putting youth voice at the middle of our work and ensuring that we appreciate intersectionality. Um, it was a clear bridge between the research that I had done on civil rights and today's disability rights movement and many of my friends um, putting identity first. Corey Weston with us today. She comes to you live from Dallas, Texas and I will now turn the mic over to Tori. Can you? Oh, Tori, we can hear you. You can hear me. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is this is awesome, and thank you for uh, such a warm introduction. Um, I'm really excited and proud to have been invited to do this webinar um, because it's this is a part of the work that, um, as folks in the liberation movement, I think we often ignore. Um, and so it's particularly important for me to be a part of this and to make sure that, that I heed my own call to intersectionality. Um, and so again, I just want to reiterate the, the value um, of being invited to participate, to collaborate, to build with you all. Thank you for the incredible work that you're already doing. Um, and I hope that critical mentoring adds value. Um, so I'm going to start 
by just kind of giving an overview of, of the critical mentoring concept. And then when I get into the context, which I, I always talk about context because it's a really important part um, of the work we do, then I will try to um, make the connections that I see um, to the work that you all are doing um, with disability mentoring. And I title this talk, um, this is a talk that I've been doing uh, all over the place for a while. I, I titled this, Y'all Got to Call That Something Else. Um, and you'll kind of notice my colloquialism uh, colloquialisms throughout. Um, but it's important for me to sort of neutralize some of the academic language, which is why I, I use the colloquialisms. Um, and it's also important to me to make sure that I connect with young people, which is another reason why I use those. But most importantly, this title is about reclaiming spaces. Um, and for me, that's the work that critical mentoring or that I'm trying to really accomplish, trying to do with critical mentoring is I'm trying to reclaim the mentoring space, that a lot of the things that we call mentoring um, aren't really mentoring at all, and that we kind of need to reclaim that word and reclaim the power uh, of the act. Uh, as Derek already said, there's some live tweeting going on, so um, I also welcome folks to um, at me on Twitter or IG and to also include the hashtag critical mentoring. Um, and I do go on usually after talks and interact with folks and um, sometimes answer questions and have discussions from there. I, I want to start with, with this quote by James Baldwin that um, was in the, the, the movie I Am Not Your Negro, um, which was out a little bit ago. This quote is, is powerful and it's powerful for um, all of us. And it reminds us of the work that we're engaged in. And I'm always trying to, and you'll hear it throughout this presentation, I'm always trying to, again, neutralize the language so that it doesn't sound so hierarchical, um, so that it doesn't sound so uh, savior-ish. And I think James Baldwin hit it on the head with, with this quote when he said, I am not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. Um, and this, again, is particularly important and relevant to our work because we need to reframe our thinking around nonprofit work. That we cannot continue to treat the populations we're serving as objects of missionary charity. That we can't keep sort of creating or, or reinforcing the system of supremacy by behaving as if we are these do-gooders, um, these saviors who are coming in to rescue people. That we have to recognize, as, as Derek said earlier, the power of identity. We have to also recognize the history um, of those identities. And in recognizing that, understand that everyone has had a place in building this country and building this world. Um, and that, that the spaces they inhabit have have benefited um, all of society. And we need to really stop thinking about the, this idea that we are going in to rescue people or save people. Um, because in that thinking and in that narrative that we then sell um, as nonprofits or as organizations doing this, this kind of work, um, we're creating a problem between us and the folks that we want to collaborate or build with. Um, I even try to sometimes avoid the word serve. Right. Um, we we want to collaborate and build with folks. We don't want them to be um, to be looked at as a deficit. Uh, we don't want to put ourselves on a higher level than they are, and that that takes a considerable amount of reframing in the nonprofit world because our narratives are often based on what folks need, what folks are lacking, um, how they are. Um, what they are missing, and then all of the things that we need to kind of come in and do in order to rescue them. And I, and I know that that's a major reframing just at the outset, but I think it's important for us to do if we really want to engage marginalized populations, um, especially for those of us who are still trying to figure out why we can't get um, to our communities in the ways that we want to. When they see this deficit framing of them, um, they often avoid our work altogether. So I think that's an important discussion that we need to have. 
So here's the sort of the rundown of critical mentoring in, in terms of how I am defining it. And, and I will say that when I originally thought about the concept of critical mentoring, I was definitely thinking about race, gender, sexuality, those types of contexts that have now been sort of um, expanded to include other contexts. So I say if young people's context were water and air, it would be impossible to breathe and impossible to drink. The critical mentoring process aims to address this. And when I say that if their context were air, were water and were air, I'm talking about the fact that the, the very society we exist in is toxic in a lot of ways to folks who are marginalized. We live in a white supremacist, patriarchal, uh, able, bodied society that defers to a sort of standard. And we are working, when we are working with young people who are on the margins, we are talking about a society that is toxic for them. We're talking about a society where if, if we were talking about water and air, it would be impossible to breathe this air, impossible to drink this water. And when we talk about context, I'll break this down more. When I think of critical mentoring, I think about mentoring that moves to clear the, the water and purify the air. It's not about using mentoring to manage sy symptoms, but it's about leveraging mentoring to address root causes. And I'll explain that a little more too. So when we talk about mentoring now, we often talk about utilizing mentoring to help young people assimilate or adapt to this toxicity. We tell them, and I'll use the race context here, we tell young folks of color, pull your pants up, don't wear hoodies, um, look unassuming. Uh, we even have a, a whole movement behind, you know, helping young people tie ties and, and look professional. And not that there isn't a necessary space for that, but we focus on how they are perceived, how they're, how they're looked at, okay? We, we talk about having them alter who they are in order to be more acceptable to society. We don't typically in mentoring relationships have the conversation about the fact that no matter how they look, they will still be marginalized and they will still be criminalized. They will still be uh, discriminated against because they are black, Latino, queer, disabled, et cetera. So in the way that we're using mentoring now, we are basically telling young people to adapt to this toxicity. We know the water is impossible to drink. We know the air is impossible to breathe. Um, we want you to put on this mask and navigate it anyway. Without having a conversation about root causes, without having a conversation about why they are perceived the way they are um, and how that can be changed or altered. So, and I'll, and I'll talk about a little bit too about how I, I, how I came to understand this. Um, in my work with young people, I started the Youth Mentoring Action Network on a school campus. And I did, uh, in setting up my mentoring program, what a lot of us do. I mean, it was an extension of, of school. Um, and anyone who, well, we've all experienced uh, school on some level or another, but anyone who is marginalized um, and in school recognizes immediately the problem with establishing a mentoring program that is an extension of school. S schools are often very problematic and violent places for young people who are marginalized to begin with. So to start a mentoring program that a sort of assumed the responsibility of extending on some level or supporting school was problematic. So I started this mentoring program, again, as an extension of school is going to help young people raise their grades, their GPAs, and graduate from high school on time and go to college, et cetera. And so my mentoring was primarily focused in that direction. And as I started having conversations with my protégés, things started feeling a, a bit overwhelming, I should say, first of all. But they also started feeling, I started recognizing the problem. So I would talk to a student, for example, about their math grade. 
And I would say, okay, Johnny, why, why are you getting a D in math? You're this amazing, you know, brain. I know that you're intelligent, you're capable, you're doing all of these cool things. For example, in music, which requires a lot of math. And I don't understand why you're having trouble with this particular math class. And the young person would say, well, you know, the teacher doesn't like me. Which again, you know, we, we, if you're an adult working with young people, you hear these types of things all the time. And we tend to, I think, dismiss them rather than entertain the conversation around that. Well, you know, my response was, well, you know, whether the teacher likes you or not, you still have a responsibility. You know, you need to show up to the class on time you need to do your work, et cetera, et cetera. The young person was persistent in this case in, in trying to teach me. Um, and, I, and I have to emphasize that too, that we have to kind of let, allow ourselves to be taught by young people because they are trying to, to communicate things to us that we often ignore. And so as I engage more in this conversation, I find out that this young person doesn't feel welcome in their math class. They feel disrespected by their math teacher. Um, the, the concepts are not even a problem. The concepts are not even being addressed or dealt with because the student can't get past the fact that they don't feel like they are welcomed in the classroom space, that they don't have a connection to the teacher, um, that in fact, this, in this case, this teacher was blatantly disrespectful to the student and to, this, and to where the student comes from. So then as a mentor, we have something to sort of reconcile with there. Do I tell my young person that despite being disrespected by the, by the teacher, despite feeling unwelcomed in the classroom, um, despite having their brilliance and intelligence ignored, right, and even quelched in some sense, that they should just continue to engage in that classroom as if that harm isn't being done to them um, in order for them to pass and get a grade. Um, so then I had to start kind of dealing with this issue. So why am I not on some level having conversations with this, with this young person about what it means to be uh, a young person of color in this classroom um, where they are not recognized as the brilliant mathematician that they are, that they in fact are, right? Um, and that really changes the trajectory of mentoring because now we're not talking about just fixing this kid, which that's what the mentoring language is really all about right now. So, so let's fix this kid. Now we've got this harder job of really starting to think about how do we help young people navigate these situations um, and then how do we partner and collaborate with them and starting to sort of fix some of these issues, right? Um, not that it means that I have to go to that teacher and you know, sort of knock their classroom door down and, and have an interaction. Maybe it doesn't mean that it needs to go to that extreme, which is where people sort of default. Um, but it may mean that I need to have a different conversation with a young person other than that they need to get their stuff together. On some level, it's acknowledging the fact that this young person is right. You're right, you're not being welcomed in your math class. You're right, your brilliance and your intelligence is not being valued. Um, and here are the reasons why, and what do you think? And then how do we navigate this together and how can I better support you um, to not only get through that, but to maybe change it? What resources could you use to sort of, you know, have conversations with this teacher or to bring your parents in or to, to go to administration? So it really changed the way that I was thinking about mentoring. And that's where the critical mentoring sort of came into play because it became more about, let's stop asking these young people to adapt to what we know is toxic. And let's start building and collaborating alongside them to address some of the root causes. And the critical in mentoring came from my, my studying or my research in uh, critical race theory. Right. And this little graph here kind of shows the connection between critical race theory um, on the left, which establishes some sort of main tenets, things like racism is normal. Um, this concept of interest convergence, convergence, which is that uh, folks who are more marginalized only get moved forward when their interests are also in the interest of the of the power elite. Um, social construction, that race is a social construction, something that we have literally made up and we use um, to sort of reinforce privilege and, and to create difference, right? And I think this the really important one is, is the concept of counter narrative. Um, and I think that's particularly important to mentoring, which is why I started off by saying, y'all gotta call that something else, right? It's a matter of, of reclaiming narrative, right? So that 
the narrative, again, as it is in mentoring right now, is that these young people need us um, because they lack all of these things and they lack all of these resources. And if they don't have us, they're never going to survive. Um, when in fact, that narrative sort of needs to be countered with, well, these young people have an incredible amount of raw talent and skill and intelligence and really what they need is support and guidance um, and someone who can help them tap into that. They're not lacking anything. Um, what, what they need is, is some support and some help to, to help them recognize and then use um, what they already have. And so I was marrying this, this critical, these critical race theory concepts on this side with sort of some basic tenets of, of mentoring, right? The activities that we engage in, the relationship that we build, um, the types of interventions we make, uh, what mentoring looks like on a policy level, what mentoring looks like on a societal level. And what I said was that, or what I, what I kind of um, brought together was the idea that this critical race theory needs to inform mentoring work. That we need to, again, consider all of these elements on the left and that those elements on the left should be informing how we engage in our mentoring relationships. And that really begins with a critical interrogation of context. That really begins with looking at what our young people are dealing with, what they're seeing every day, what they're hearing every day, um, what they're experiencing, what, what are their challenges. And I usually have plenty, plenty of examples to draw from, right? Um, we've already had three police shootings of young Black teenagers, right, in the last few months. Um, we see on the news consistently young people uh, having violence committed against them by adults. So the, the context is easy to see. Most of the time, we just don't want to sort of acknowledge that context or we ignore it or displace it in order to do what we what we think is easier which is to just tell the kid the young person well if you just fix these things then that that that's not likely to happen to you right um and in the case of of this particular network the disability mentoring coalition i think it's it's particularly important to to reinforce the idea of intersectionality right as a part of our context and i'm and i have here a picture of of eddie nopu um who is a activist uh, a scholar a social entrepreneur who is currently at oxford um absolutely thriving but is um an amazing example right of this concept of intersectionality when it comes to the liberation movement and his quote here on the right says, I am a black, queer, feminist thinker. So just, just in that line, look at all the aspects of his identity that intersect um, and, and that on some level compound to make um, discrimination against him like even more intense, right? I am a black, queer, feminist thinker. I move through this world as black, as queer, as disabled. But I also just want to live my best life. I don't want to live in a world where my identity is visceral at every turn, but I exist in a world that doesn't care about black people, nor queer people, and definitely not people living with disabilities. So when we think about intersectionality, we are often thinking about race, gender, sexuality. Uh, I navigate this world as, as a black queer woman, right? And we think, about, we think about those sort of concepts and I think that those are limited. And what Eddie Nopu embodies is that, is, is, a, is a little of all, of all of that, right? He's black, he's queer, he's disabled, he's navigating this world with all of those identities. And so I think as mentors, we ask ourselves, and this is what I ask mentors in terms of critical mentoring all the time. We ask ourselves, how do you mentor Eddie Nopu? How do you mentor 
a young person who's black, who's queer, who's disabled, who who's who's who lives their life at that intersection or, or at those intersections. What should change or be altered about the conversations that I have with Eddie, about the ways that I'm talking to him about navigating, about the concept of grit or resilience, right? Which are problematic concepts for young people in this position. They are they already have grit. They already have resilience. The, the very the very idea that they exist in this space where where we are in an anti-black, anti-queer, okay, anti-disabled, where we value uh, whiteness, where we value ability, where we value um, cisgender folks. The fact that these that these folks exist and have survived means that they have grit and that they have resilience. So now we're getting, and if I can, there's another quote from Eddie that I that I pulled up in this article about him. Please look him up. He's He's really incredible um, and doing some incredible work. He says here, I am exceptionalized because the overwhelming majority of young people with disabilities are denied the opportunity to live their best lives. People want me to be the benchmark for what people with disabilities can achieve instead of addressing the socioeconomic issues that make life difficult for people similar to me. That is unbelievably tragic. So what he said there is, is that exactly what I'm saying about critical mentoring addressing root causes? That, you know, and he says people want to exceptionalize him because he's thriving and they're trying to use him as an example, right? You're an exception to the rule. You're doing this amazing thing. What he's saying is that, no, really what you need to be looking at is why is it so difficult for folks like me to thrive or in his words, to live their best lives? And so again, with critical mentoring, I'm really asking folks to, to rethink the way they engage in mentoring relationships with young people at the margins. And a lot of the work we do um, has to start with language. And so I like this quote that I pulled out as well, it says when a critique of language that makes reference to disability is not welcome, it is nearly inevitable that as a disabled person, I am not welcome either. So again, the idea is that, back to this idea of counter narrative, back to this idea of reframing, uh, reframing the narrative and reframing our language and rethinking through how we are doing this, right? That we need to sort of, re again, reclaim mentoring space as a liberatory space, as a space where young people can thrive, as a, as a space where young people have voice, as a space where identities are centered, um, instead of ignored or pushed to the margins, right? Which then reinforces the sort of harm or violence that society is already doing to young people. Mentoring is supposed to be a safe space. And so how can we say that we are providing safe spaces for these young people um, if we're not even willing to engage in, in a language change or narrative change, right? So here's some things that I point out because I'm looking at my time and I'm trying to be respectful. I wanna make sure people can ask questions as well. Um, here's some things that I think are important for really sort of doing critical mentoring. One, that we have got to be youth centric. And what I'm finding right now in, the, in my critical mentoring work is that everybody loves this concept. Everyone loves the idea of youth centrism. And, and I love that they love the idea. But then when I ask folks how they implement the idea, Here's the problem. Um, when I say youth centrism, I mean really making sure that youth have voice, power, and choice in all aspects of the organization. And I can't emphasize that more. The tokenism that we often engage in with having young folks um, just say something at meetings or uh, we love to put them in sort in marketing materials or uh, sort of flaunt them in for in front of board members, right? Now I'm not talking about those surface level token elements of engagement. I'm talking about having the folks that you work with, collaborate with, build with, be in every single aspect of your organization. They need to have voting seats on the board. 
They need to be on the staff. They need to be volunteers. They need to be a part of the evaluation team. They need to be a part of everything. Youth centric means building your program with or including the voice of the folks that you're working with. So young people have to have a seat at the table and they need to have a seat at the table at every level. We need to acknowledge and respect and value what they bring to the organization, what they what they bring in terms of um, of just altering the, uh, the even the, the, the direction that sometimes our programs are going in. We cannot say that we are doing work on behalf of young people if young people aren't included in the conversation to begin with. That's very, very important. This concept of intersectionality, which we also um, talked a little bit about, the idea that we have to acknowledge that folks are living their lives at intersections where a lot of different aspects come together to often compound the discrimination or the marginalization that they are experiencing. What is it like to be a disabled person in American society? Is that different if you are a black disabled person? Is that different if you are a queer disabled person? Uh, is that different if you are a not non-binary um, disabled person? How does this all come together to impact your experience? And then how do I as a mentor engage in that or engage in conversations around that or help to support you um, in terms of that? And that's where it comes down to the third bullet of altering our mentoring conversations. We cannot necessarily stick to these scripted mentoring conversations about grades and attendance um, and career. And it's not that those conversations can't take place. It's that we need to be open and we need to be more honest um, and we need to be willing to engage in conversations that our young people uh, require from us, need, need of us. Um, because they are often dealing with a lot of these issues either internally with themselves or with each other, okay? And they're doing it without us. And so when we, when we call ourselves mentors and we, 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 we sort of tout the idea that we are a resource and a guide and we are a, you know, a wise and trusted advisor, and then we sort of ignore these conversations that really have uh, that really have uh, the power, right, or the opportunity to 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 really change the direction um, of our young person's lives. We have to kind of question what we're engaging in at that point. If we're not willing to have these conversations. How useful are we? If we are reinforcing the trauma and the violence that systems of oppression that exist in schools and in other spaces. And we're reinforcing that in our mentoring relationship. How helpful are we? Um, or, or who are we being helpful to would be another question, right? Um, so I really think it has to alter our mentoring conversations, which means we have to open ourselves up and we have to be more willing to have conversations that might be a little more uncomfortable. And that also means, you know, for program coordinators and folks in charge, that we have to provide training and support for our mentors so that they're able to engage in these conversations. They need to understand the language um, of critical race theory. They need to understand the language, language around intersectionality. They need to understand um, how to have youth-led conversations within their mentoring relationships so that they don't get lost um, when, when the young person brings up what's happening in their Twitter newsfeed that they're concerned about or how they're being treated in school um, you know, or what kinds of, what other kinds of encounters they've had. Um, and then finally, there needs to be some critical mapping. And I'll, and I'll talk a lot more about this because this is sort of a new addition to the work that I've been doing around critical mentoring. There is a, a book out called Critical Race Spatial Analysis that has really impacted my thinking in terms of how we look at spaces physically. Um, and this particular book uh, does focuses on critical race theory and GIS mapping to look at educational education inequality, right? Um, so in other words, they're looking at how schools are funded, 
all right, based on, on maps. Um, and we know how this, most of us know how this system works, that, that schools are funded um, by uh, taxes, um, property taxes. And so that neighborhoods that are poor, neighborhoods that have been divested from, um, often also have schools that are underfunded and that have a host of other problems as a result of that underfunding. And it's not that funding is the only thing, but it is an important part um, of what those young people have access to, right? And only because they are sort of born in a place that doesn't have, um, that doesn't have more money, that doesn't have more resources. So that book focuses on that. But what I've learned um, as a result of reading that work is that this critical mapping is important in a lot of other ways. Um, it's important for us to understand the communities that our young people exist in. It's important for us to understand where they have identified resources, where they have identified spaces that they can't go into and why. Um, and you can do critical mapping, not just of communities, you can do critical mapping of your organizations. Um, I plan to actually do some critical map mapping with my young people next year to understand how they see um, our organization um, in terms of, of a physical map, um, where they think things happen, uh, how, they, how they see sort of power distributed, um, where they feel like they're involved, where they, where they feel like they're not, because I think it will give me a better idea of whether I'm doing what I, what I say um, I'm doing. I think the other important element, especially for this particular network of critical mapping, is to have young people identify where they can go and where they can't go. Um, and I think that mapping gives us a, a, a visual of spaces that our young people are included in and excluded from as a result of ability um, or other elements. Um, and so this critical mapping is something that I'm starting to do in trainings where I have folks map out their communities or I have folks map out their organizations with different intentions, depending on what we're looking at. But I think that this is an important part of the work is understanding, again, not always from our perspective, but from our young people's understanding what spaces look like and how they are able to navigate spaces. And then using that really important information to, again, change the way that we have mentoring relationships and sort of change the way um, that we engage. And I think. Um, I'll definitely stop there. I, I have, I feel like I have a lot more to say, but I want to make sure that I can talk to folks um, because I know that there are probably questions, comments, concerns, and all sorts of things. But again, I just want to reiterate that the work that you guys are doing in particular is, is so very important for our liberation movement because we cannot leave folks behind. And we have a lot of conversations, and Elizabeth reminded me of this um, in a chat we were having. We have a lot of conversations about race, about gender, about sexuality. We do not um, have enough conversations about ability and how that plays a role in all of us moving forward. So again, I just thank you guys for having me. And um, with that, we'll open it up to, to conversation. Tori, thank you so much. So much. I'm, I'm back on, and I wanted to. I'm getting a little feedback. Hopefully, it's not bothering you all. Um, I wanted to, to obviously thank you. Your your passion comes um, blended so nicely with your wisdom and how you share the information. It's really attainable, and you can put your arms around it. And you know, Yolanda is. Um, a rising leader out in California, Yolanda Vargas, and she had a chat comment uh, that starts out, this is so freaking great. And I had a chance to work on a youth-led project with Yolanda um, back in November, December, and it was just an awesome experience and changed how I approach work in many ways. Um, if, you, if you can see her comment, Tori, at the end of it, it says, where can I learn skills to do that without ruffling feathers? Ooh, nice. I see Tori's live on the webcam there now. Um, <laughs> you're looking good. <laughs> um, so if you can see Yolanda's comment, maybe give her a little feedback about uh, her question there. We'll start with that. Yeah, so um, should I, can everyone see it or? 
Well, I'm not sure about that. So if you could just some, digest it quickly and then maybe summarize it, and I, um, that would be great. Okay. Um, so she's she's asking about um, better ways to support youth when they deal with toxic situations. If it's better to have private conversations, if it's better to um, and now I got people or other people are adding so hold on. <laughs> um, if it's better to give them uh, coping mechanisms, she she says, but I don't I don't know how to facilitate meaningful change when coming up against oppressive institutions. Uh, where can I learn skills to do that without ruffling feathers? And um, thank you for that question. That I get the I get the latter part of that question all the time. How do I do this without ruffling feathers? And um, I I was just in a in a a hip hop panel where we were talking about um, sexual assault and, and someone asked a similar question, like how do I have these conversations with folks without offending them or without like turning them off or, you know, and there's this, this, this is an interesting dialogue. Like we need to be having this dialogue because we're in this sort of society now where, where people wanna be like a little more politically correct and um, you know, coalition building is important, and um, people also want to just sort of be um, mindful of feelings, and, and all of that is to be respected and appreciated. But I think, for me, I have trouble with the sort of wanting to avoid problems. Um, I know that it's it's hard for us because. You know, I'm a, I'm a nice person. I don't want to come off as, as sort of a jerk here. Um, I don't want to have fights with people. You know, we, we and I hear that you don't want your, your youth, your young people to be retaliated against. You don't want to be retaliated against. These are these are important things. At some point, though, I think we have to decide, depending on what's happening, I think we have to decide how forward we will be. Right. Um, in some situations, people need to get checked. And I'll, I'll be honest there. Okay, some situations people need to get checked. One of the reasons why these systems of oppression sort of just kind of run us over is because we are always the nice guys, like looking for these nice ways to deal with problems while they are just running us over. Um, and I think that that's important to remember. I, I, I recall an interview with Angela Davis when the interviewer was asking her, if she condones violence and, and if she thinks that that's okay. And Angela Davis said, you know, I think you're asking the wrong question. You're asking me if I condone violence, but you're not asking the folks who, you know, are bombing churches and killing young people. You're not asking the folks, you know, that are shooting young people dead in the street if they're okay with violence. It's, it's only me who has to sort of patrol or control the way I, I react to systems of oppression. So I know that's probably not um, the, the gentle answer, but I think that we, depending on what's happening to our young people, we need to decide which ones are, which issues are issues that we navigate carefully and that we have conversations with. And I think we know who those people are who are willing to hear us um, and that we can have a sit down conversation with. And then we need to decide what times that we can't, there's not, we can't be nice, right? That in this situation, we need to just do what we need to do. We need to have conversations with young people. We need to get our support systems in line and we need to push back. Um, and I think it, not every situation requires the fire approach, right? And not every situation requires the PC approach. We have to kind of judge depending on what that situation is, who are the folks involved. But I do think that we have to stop policing ourselves all the time. We let people get away with a lot because we're constantly policing ourselves and, and worrying about how we're being received. When the folks on the other end who are doing the harm and the damage don't stop to think about how they're being received, they don't typically care. They just do the damage. And so I think when it comes to really protecting our young people, we need to be a little more aggressive. Um, and I know that everyone's not going to agree with that, but I do think we need to be a little more verbal and a little more aggressive and, and, and um, strategic too. Right. And again, that also means within institutions sort of lining up our allies, you know, lining up our power base as much as possible. But this also goes to an institutional issue of, you know, hiring and firing and putting folks in the right place. I'm not saying that the work is easy. It, you know, systems change is hard and it's slow. Right. 
Um, but I also think that we need to just stop being um, uh, stop being too PC, that we need to sometimes just say what needs to be said. And I hope that answers answers your question, Yolanda. That's a good question. There's not really a, 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 a yes or no. There's not really an exact answer <laughs> to that. But thank you for asking it because I think it's important. Awesome. Thanks, Yolanda. And um, just so you know, Tori, Yolanda's out there in California with you. She's hey. uh, up, up the coast a little bit. The um, She works for a group called um, Youth Organizing Disabled and Proud. So it'd be yeah. good if, if you could uh, learn more about some of their work. Um, we do have another question that was posted by Judy Shanley of Easter Shields. Um, Judy's in Chicago. And um, uh, her, her chat it, the question says, uh, you know, you can read it with us there, but she wants to know what you do about measurement. And, um, you know, Judy's a, a data person and is always yeah. asking how are we going to prove what works in mentoring. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that, I know if you haven't read Tori's book, then you haven't read the chapter about measurement and data collection. But Tori, if you could um, give give Judy some some details on your thoughts there. Yeah. So thank you for asking that as well, Judy. So I think that is, is important. Um, and one of the things I stress in my organization is, is definitely multi-method or mixed methods approach. Like we definitely have uh, quantitative data, but we definitely also center qualitative data. I think both are good. Um, what I always tell people is that you don't necessarily have to shift your outcomes. One of the things that I've, I'm pretty proud of that we've done with the Youth Mentoring Action Network is we are still able to sort of measure the outcomes that typical mentoring programs measure, right? So we still um, pride ourselves on helping young people get through high school. We still pride ourselves on helping young people access college. We got 100% graduation rate from high school, got a 98% college attainment rate. For those who go to college, 100% of them stay in and graduate. Um, so we are in terms of data, we're still churning out, right, the, the data that people like to see. The only difference is our approach, right? So instead of sort of centering school, centering GPA, centering um, these things in our mentoring conversations, we really focus on mentoring the whole young person. We really focus on um, tuning in on what they need and what they want for themselves and their future. And we, we sort of leverage our, our relationship, our mentoring relationship to support them in that. Um, and then what happens is that the more that they are supported, the more that they feel like they have voice, um, the more that they um, are able to sort of exercise that voice and figure th and navigate and figure things out, the better our, our outcomes seem to be. So I kind of, I'll go back to the idea of youth centrism and having young people at every aspect of your organization. Um, well, we've, been able to say is that as a result of giving young people, and I, I don't even like to use the word giving, but as a as a result of, of establishing partnerships with young people, we actually do more to support those sort of typical mentoring outcomes than we were in the first place. Because young people not only now um, have voice, power, and choice within the organization, but they're building their resumes. They're building their college application. They're able to say, I served on a board of directors um, in a nonprofit organization. I was able to learn the ins and outs of social entrepreneurship by um, volunteering at this nonprofit organization and, and, and um, being a, a coordinating a program or coordinating an event or um, uh, talking to policymakers. And so all of the things that we have young people do actually serve to sort of reinforce the very outcomes that we wanted for mentoring in the first place. The only difference is now that they're sort of in charge of that and definitely a lot more bought into it as well because they feel like they have space and they have that power and choice. So they, they completely take ownership of it. Um, and so not only are their voices being heard, but again, those outcomes. So now we're able to say that, you know, we're actually a college and career ready organization because we are helping young people to learn these valuable skills. We're helping young people to build a resume, to build a, um, a solid college application, right? And then they are utilizing those skills to move on to the next level. So the, the really the difference, the difference isn't the outcomes, the difference is our approach, that we're sort of centering young the youth voice, that we are supporting them and having these conversations about how to navigate spaces, about how to 
um, deal with systems of oppression, right? And that in that they're becoming keener in how they navigate because they're the, the difference is now that they're aware, right? So instead of saying, oh, if you just pull your pants up, you just take your hoodie off, then you'll be good. We have an actual critical conversation about that. And then they understand here are spaces where it's, uh, well, I should, let me, let me start here. All spaces are spaces where I can be myself, right? But if I want to project a career or a professional image, this is what I need to do, okay? If I'm not worried about that and I'm in a more informal space, here is how I need to be, okay? Um, so there are, we, we teach them that, you know, diff, you, you navigate different spaces in different ways, right? We teach them um, how to use their voices in different ways, okay? Um, we, talk, we talk very specifically about colloquialism and when and where it's quote unquote appropriate to use that. We also talk about taking the risk of sort of mixing that up, right? And using, like I did, using colloquialism in academic presentation. So we, we at least have the conversation so that they're more aware. When they're more aware, then they can make the decision. Um, but it's not us sort of enforcing or imposing society's ideas on them, right? We have a conversation. We're aware of all of the different facets and the consequences, right? And, and then from there, they make the decision. And again, it's about they have the power to choose and then they have the power to participate in ways that they want to. And then as a result of that, our outcomes are basically, again, the same as other mentoring outcomes because now our young people are informed, they have resources, they have support, and now they have experience. And I hope that answers your question. I think um, you said, are there outcomes for the mentors? I do think that that's something that could be um, better measured. I think we do a lot of work with the young people and we forget about the young people that, that we forget about the work that adults need to do. And so um, one of the things that I hope to develop, and I think this is something that's probably going to be done in relationship with the mentor, are ways to sort of measure the cultural efficacy, um, the uh, critical consciousness of mentors, and then how that in turn in, impacts the mentoring relationship. So there's some more sort of like hard data um, there, but I think that that's something to be developed. Thanks, Judy, for the question. And again, Tori, for the, the information. And, and um, Judy's going to check out the chapter. I'll just give a little plug for the critical mentoring book. If you like today's session and you want to dig in more, not only is the book full of information about the research and the thinking, but there's actionable steps to, to implement the thoughts into your work. So it's a real tool. And um, you know, another thing that I loved about it is it's just under a hundred pages. <laughs> Anyone, um, anyone's busy, you can fit this book in. Don't worry about that. Yep. Here's a comment here from Janelle. Yes, she says we often talk to youth about self-disclosure as a choice, and that cho and that the choice is theirs. Pros and cons based on the situation. Sounds like you respect self-disclosure as a choice with benefits and risks. Is that correct? And I say it absolutely is. So um, again, the more that the young person um, is aware and talks through, um, then they're able to better navigate for themselves, right? And again, the the idea of the mentoring relationship is that those young people are empowered, that they have a platform to be able to make those decisions. We keep saying we're trying to get them ready for adulthood, but then we don't get them ready for adulthood because they don't ever get choices. They don't ever get to do anything. They don't ever get to say anything. Um, so for me, this, is, this, this definitely serves two purposes, right? It centers them in the conversation so that we understand what we need to do as an organization to, to align ourselves with them, but then it also gives them skills, resources, tools that they need to really start preparing um, for adulthood. And uh, Gail Certain, who's on, who's my, who's my co-founder, reminded me to um, tell, tell you guys about uh, a remix that our young people just put out, um, which sort of exemplifies this, this process that I'm talking about. So she's a musician um, who works with all of our young artists in our, in our program. 
And they actually went into the studio, I would say it's about a month ago, Gail, you can correct me if I'm wrong, to remix one of the songs on her on her album. Um, it was completely youth led. So young people, we, we, you know, we all went into the studio together. We had young people who were filming the process. We had young people who were participating. Uh, a young person produced it, um, sort of rewrote or rearranged the music around um, the original song. We had young people do the artwork. Um, we had young people actually do the rollout of the publicity for the song. So we have these young people who participate in this project um, as young artists who have learned sort of every aspect of this business, right? They've learned um, how to organize a project. They've learned how to produce music, how to write music. They've learned how they put cover work or cover artwork to the music. They've learned how to get it distributed online. They put a documentary together. So now these young people have this whole resume full of things that they are able to do um, for college. Um, and as young artists, they're probably going to apply to a music school or a film school, et cetera. But they're completely prepared and they exercise complete voice and power and leadership over the entire project. And we were just there providing support. Hey, what do you need for this step? What do you need for that step? What can I help you with? Maybe giving some advice here and there. But that's an example of youth ownership of an entire project that also then feeds into real life skills that they'll need to be able to move to their next steps. In that vein, Tori, with the real life skills and next steps, with your work, how much intersection do you see with speaking to and preparing in a readiness sense for jobs and careers and the connection a lot of the member programs that we have in the Disability Mentoring Coalition focus on mentoring um, towards employment or during employment and mm -hmm. trying to have a, a personal vision develop that, you know, it's not about just one job, but it's about a career and it's about independence through work. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, so um, that work in general or how to do it? Clarify for me. Well, more work in general. Like it, you know, not about a job, but about um, the value of work and how to view oneself with a work relationship, and right. not to feel like only certain jobs might be for you know you as a, an individual. Yeah. So um, again, I will credit young people with teaching teaching us at the Youth Mentoring Action Network that that lesson. Um, so the project I just described with young artists. You know, when I first started the Youth Mentoring Action Network, I never ever thought that I would um, be even considering having a music or arts arm of our program. It just wasn't in my trajectory. I'm not an artist. Um, but young people who kept coming to our program to work specifically with Gail because she is a musician kept saying, this is something we really want to do. And our parents are not sort of offering us any training because they want me to do something that's going to make money. Um, and schools aren't offering it because, you know, they're kind of on the STEM track or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was important for us to listen to them and to give them a space as young artists. And then what we did was we said, well, you know what, if you're going, if you're serious about music or art or, you know, or whatever it is you're going to in this space, um, you should get as much support as possible so that you understand, you know, what you're, what you're getting into or what different avenues there are. Um, for you as a young artist or musician, right? And so what we started doing was, again, youth-led and youth-initiated, we started building programming that would support them, right? So here are the ins and outs of the music business. You want to learn how to mix music? You have to learn Logic Pro. So we partnered with Apple and we said, hey, can we bring our young people in and can you teach them how to run, um, you know, industry standard music software? Um, then we taught them, hey, here's how you monetize your music online. Um, we brought in some industry experts and they said, here's some tips and um, of the trade, et cetera. So it was really about us. Again, that's back to the idea of being youth centric. We listened to young people when they said, hey, I want to be an artist and I need mentoring in that area because no one else really wants to help me with that. Um, so we said, fine. Right. We listened to young people. We 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 had young people lead the programming. Um, and then we said, how can we support you and what you want to do and what you what you feel works for you? And I think that's kind of the back to this concept of, of being adultist, right? We kind of, oh, society, we defer to what society says 
should be. Um, you know, you have to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. You have to kind of be these things that have dependable. You have to have dependable paycheck. You know, you have to like punch the clock, right? And work for 30 years and retire and have benefits and all that good stuff. Well, our young people aren't thinking this way. Um, and thank God they aren't, because if they were thinking that way, then we wouldn't have Facebooks and Twitters and Google and all these other things, right? So we kind of have to, as you said, support young people and seeing all kinds of things as careers, right? Because if it's possible in any generation, it's possible now, right? They've we didn't we didn't know that there were going to be actual job descriptions that focused on being a social media represent uh, representative, right? That didn't exist even. 10 years ago, young people brought that to us, right? So we just have to provide them with the, some of those skills and, and support um, and ideas to be able to have them sort of zoom in on how do they make a career work for them, whatever that is, right? Whether it's being an artist, whether it's being a social media guru, because you can definitely get paid for doing that now. Um, but I think when they have those skills, when they have the, the skills of you know speaking skills, writing skills, organizing skills, right? Some of the, again, the things that we do in our nonprofits, that if we just let young people shadow us or be a part of, they would learn those skills, they could apply them to anything. Um, that's how we really train young people. I think we have to start thinking about using our organizations as training spaces, not always sending them somewhere else, right? Because a lot of the skills that we are utilizing in our nonprofits, again, if we let our young people lead some of these projects, they would get those skills and they would they could apply them to whatever they wanted to do. So taking those sort of baseline skills and then saying, what works for you? And I like that Angela said, success can be defined differently. Exactly. What works for that young person? What do they want to do? How do they see themselves operating? Take those skills and apply that to whatever it is they want to do. Thank you very much. I think that was really helpful and that connects um, systems change, but also bringing young people to um, not conform. And we see some comments from Angela there. That's um, that's pretty helpful. The success can be defined differently and um, make sure that the, the mentoring training that we're providing is supporting that, that we're not conforming from the beginning. So that's awesome. Hey, as we're, we're looking at the clock here, I'm just bring it up. It's uh, two sixteen now on the East Coast, and I think we'll we have time for uh, maybe a last question or two, depending on how long Tori's response might be. <laughs> <laughs> Which we love the details, though, because it helps us understand the model and how to implement. Any other questions? Now, Tori, we're, we've had uh, representatives from. Um, you know, at one point we hit twenty eight organization. Some people um, are, are meeting with others in conference rooms, um, but the representation was really cool. A lot of national organizations were on the line today with us um, that have operations like Easter Seals in 72 different locations. Um, and then we had um, uh, four or five, I think, programs from um, Institute for Educational Leadership that run um, uh, mentoring programs at different sites in the country for marginalized youth. Um, and um, we also had some guests, Elise Kramer from the ARC was on, a national uh, association as well. Um, so it's been a really cool representation. Um, anyone else have any questions? I'm, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, Thank you all for being here too. Yeah, well, you know, if we don't see any other questions coming in, there's Tanisha, thanks for joining us from AUCD. Now, any any um, final comments that you would like to, to provide, Tori? Um, just again, to reiterate the fact that I, I really do appreciate and value the work that, that you all do, please consider me a collaborator in this work. Reach out to me, um, again, on Twitter, on IG, um, at T. Weaston. I appreciate hearing from you guys and everything that you guys are doing and how you're applying critical mentoring concepts. And uh, thank you again for having me. Keep doing the work. Wonderful. Well, Tori, thank you so much for the, your time today. How busy you are, and um, you've been a great collaborator. We appreciate it. I, you know, um, when when we talk about the the disability narrative imperative from the disability community's perspective, that's a theme that I've heard in many sectors over the past couple of years. And when Tori speaks about changing the narrative or providing a counter narrative. They're just 
amazing parallels between the work that's being done and importantly needs to be done. And um, you know, the National Disability Community uh, Mentoring Coalition was created about two and a half years ago to rethink how we work together in the mentoring space. And with Tori's work, she's asking us to push this further in a, a remix and rethink of how we do mentoring itself. And so it's been a great honor to have you with, with us. We appreciate um, your time and we look forward to continuing our work with you as we move forward together. Um, thank you to everybody for joining the, the webinar uh, live today. And for those of you that are listening to the recorded version, if you would like to get further information about the National Disability Mentoring Coalition, please visit us online at disabilitymentors.org. Um, our coalition is open to anyone to join. You can submit an application there uh, online, and um, we do have monthly meetings. We look forward to our next meeting. Uh, we look uh, to mid-July, and we'll be in touch to schedule that in the near future. Again, thanks, Tori. Uh, be safe out there in Texas, and to everyone, have a great afternoon. Thank you all.